Good morning, church family. Uh, I'm here once again to bring God's word to you. You're likely watching this on uh, on Sunday, which would be January 31st. And uh, my prayer, my hope for you is that wherever you are and however you're uh, spending your time uh, right now, I pray that you're uh, staying connected to your church family, that you are in God's word, that you are trusting in him and uh, and praying, praying for your church leaders, praying for your civil leaders, praying um, for the state of the world. Uh, we are always um, thankful to be reminded that Christ sits on the throne. And, uh, and in, in a lot of ways, our, our series in Daniel is pointing us in that direction, reminding us that God is sovereign over all the nations of men. And so we're very thankful to be able to open up God's word this morning. Um, so why don't we pray together? And, then, uh, and if you have your Bibles, um, then uh, open them to Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to continue this series called Daniel and the Everlasting Kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, no matter what's going on in the world around us, your, your word is unchanging. Uh, it is the standard by which uh, we learn how to live and to breathe and to have our being. And so I pray that uh, this morning you would speak to us from your word, uh, that you would train us up with your word, and I pray that uh, we would be equipped for every good work this morning. Um, through uh, the, the hearing of and the application of your word. I pray that you would help me to articulate well everything that you've laid on my heart to say, and I pray that your spirit would be here even working through these, uh, these disembodied means uh, to distribute your grace and your truth uh, to your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. So Daniel, uh, today, uh, last week, if you missed it, I would encourage you to even just pause this and go back and get uh, last week's introductory sermon to uh, this series in the book of Daniel called Daniel and the Everlasting Kingdom. Last week, uh, we just looked at the first um, seven verses of the, of the uh, book and uh, kind of set the historical and spiritual context uh, which would just be important because we're going to come back to some of that information of sort of the larger context that's going on. Um, but uh, suffice to say, um, the book of Daniel takes place and kind of follows the life of Daniel. As I said last week, it really spans uh, essentially about 70 years of Daniel's life. He, he arrives in Babylon after Babylon's uh, first uh, victory over Judah and Jerusalem. It's about 20 years before the temple is completely destroyed, Jerusalem is completely destroyed, and the fullness of the exile takes place. Daniel arrives in Babylon likely around the age of 20, and uh, we know he's still alive um, when he is uh, uh, close to 90 in the third year of Cyrus, which is when he's uh, doing the last few visions in Daniel 10 uh, to 12. We noted the outline of the book. I won't go into all of that, but uh, I would encourage you to go back and take a look. Today's sermon uh, will cover verses 8 to 21, though I'm going to read the chapter in its entirety because the, uh, uh, the chapter fits together and I want you to see the structure of it before it gets into the narrative. But we're going to get into the sort of the narrative section of the first, um, the first um, tension in the text. As I said last week, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are stories or narratives about Daniel and his friends uh, trying to be faithful to God in the midst of a hostile environment in the midst of a hostile culture. So today, uh, we're going to be looking particularly at verses 8 to 21, and the sermon title today is Only One Master. Only One Master. So I'm going to read uh, chapter 1 in its entirety, because there's a few things I do want to point back to from our text last week, um, but uh, follow along in your Bibles. Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Okay. Uh, I want you to note that because we're going to come back to um, the first, our second uh, verse there. But let's continue. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. 
they were to be educated for three years. At the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths that are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine, and they, and, uh, they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for the, these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of, time, of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. The king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the enchanters that were in all of his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. So that's the first chapter of Daniel, and we're going to focus on now the narrative. So last week we looked at the first seven verses that just kind of set up the historical context. Um, today we're going to look at the, the narrative as a whole. And so there's a couple things to note. I actually had a question this week that was an interesting one. Somebody asked whether or not Daniel and his friends were eunuchs. Um, there is a, uh, a, a minor prophet that seems to allude to the fact that, uh, that godly eunuchs would, have been, would be in the palace of Babylon. Um, but on top of that, you have this, this chief of the eunuchs who ends up being chief over Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and so uh, I had that question. It's an interesting question, but the word for eunuch here certainly can mean eunuch as in, as in somebody who has been castrated. Um, but this, uh, this word is also used for Potiphar in, uh, in Egypt. You remember Potiphar was uh, the man whose house Joseph landed in when he was sold into slavery in Egypt. And Potiphar's Potiphar had a wife, so he was not a eunuch, but this is the same Hebrew word that's used here for this particular chief. Um, the, the, the word can actually mean like innkeeper, and so I, th I think this word is probably best translated as something like chief of staff. Um, so we don't necessarily uh, know whether or not Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were uh, eunuchs. We don't hear anything about their wives, and so maybe they were. Um, but it might be that this man wasn't a eunuch either, but was sort of a chief of staff. He was in charge of all of the people who, uh, who were being assimilated to be brought into uh, the palace. Um, the only reason I really mentioned that is because I got the question, but also because this further adds to the, um, I think, comparison. Last week, we talked about how Daniel was, was sort of a second Joseph and how Joseph is a Christ-like figure, Daniel is a Christ-like figure. And in last week's sermon, we talked about a lot of uh, various ways. And so just in the same way that Daniel now finds, um, finds uh, a favor with what's called the eunuch or what's called the, the chief of staff here, Daniel finds um, favor with Potiphar and uh, in, in his narrative. Um, a couple other things just to kind of note. In verse 2, it says, The Lord gave Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, in, in, there's a lot of different ways in the Hebrew that, uh, that we can translate God or Lord, right? We can use the words Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah. 
Daniel uses in, in verse 2 there, uh, and the Lord, and that's the word Adonai, which is one of the names of God, which literally is rendered my master. And that's going to become important in just a moment. So, and my master, right, the Lord, Adonai, gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now, it's interesting. Um, the word that's used here for vessels, kind of talking about these artifacts, is, uh, is quite interesting. Um, what I want you to recognize is what this symbolized, okay? So when, um, when Nebuchadnezzar defeats Jerusalem and takes some of the artifacts from the temple, some of God's artifacts for worshiping him, and brings them and puts them into his own, the house to his God. So literally what's happening is he's taking artifacts out of the temple to Yahweh and placing them in the temple of his own gods. Uh, as I said last week, the chief God in uh, Babylon was Marduk. And uh, so he would have been taking artifacts from the temple of Yahweh and placing them into the temple of Marduk. And what I want you to understand about what this means kind of cosmically is that the capturing of temple artifacts and placing them in the house of his own gods was an act of war against God. Um, you recall the story, it's in 1 Samuel 5. So you can write down 1 Samuel 5 and maybe you can go there and read this narrative at some point this week. But in 1 Samuel 5, the Philistines win, in, win a battle against Israel and they capture the Ark of the Covenant. And you might remember this story. They take the Ark of the Covenant, right? So again, this is, this is God's presence, which is to be in his tabernacle. This is before the temple was built, to be in his tabernacle. They capture the Ark of the Covenant and they take it and it says they place it in the house of Dagon, which was one of the gods of the Philistines. And so what happened there, and, and the text is very clear that this is an act of war. And what happens there is that God goes to war against Dagon. Yahweh goes to war against Dagon. Why? Because the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant, take it out of the tabernacle, out of the house of Yahweh, and place it in the house of Dagon. And if you remember the story, you remember what happens. They place the Ark of the Covenant before a statue of Dagon in their own little tabernacle, in their own little house to their God. And they come back the next day, and Dagon is face down, bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. And the Philistines get all riled up about this, obviously. And so they, they strap their ropes around Dagon against their god, this big stone statue. And they lift it back up and, you know, they go to bed. And the next morning they come and the statue of Dagon is not only toppled over again, but its head is cut off and its hands are cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. And then what happens is plagues break out in the Philistine camp such that they get rid of the ark because they recognize that taking the ark of Yahweh and taking it out of the house of Yahweh and placing it in the house of Dagon, they were declaring war against Yahweh and Yahweh went to war against them, toppled their statue, crushed their idol and sent plagues into their camp. And so they send the Ark of the Covenant back. They don't want anything to do with it anymore because Yahweh declared war on Dagon. What, what happens now in the book of Daniel, interestingly, is that they take these vessels out of the temple, these, these artifacts out of the temple, bring them into their, uh, the house of their God. And that's, again, it's an act of war. There's a difference, though, this time. The difference here is that this time God is going to enlist his people to fight the battle with him. You remember that when Moses went into Egypt and God's people were captured and, and taken slaves in Egypt, this time not, you know, his, his uh, Ark of the Covenant or any artifacts, but his people are now enslaved in Egypt. What happens there? God goes to war with, with Egypt. God brings plagues. God goes about and does the warfare himself to the point where even once the plague convinced Pharaoh to let him, uh, let, make him let their people go, um, Moses leads them out and, uh, and God parts the Red Sea and swallows up the Egyptian army behind them in the Red Sea. And so we see that several times God goes to war with these foreign nations who capture his possessions and, 
and God does the battle himself. But God's use of Daniel and his friends reveals that God's people have matured enough to work alongside him in the battle. But what I want you to notice is I want you to see the gospel picture in this, okay? Notice how God does war. Because of the sins of his people, God allows himself to be captured and abused, right? It was the Ark of the Covenant that was captured. It was, it was God himself allowing himself to be in here. The, the vessels, the, the artifacts from the temple of the Lord are, are, uh, are captured. And we're going to see that they're, they're abused and they're put to profane use later on in the book. This will come up when Belshazzar takes over from his father, Nebuchadnezzar. But because of the sins of his people, God allows himself to be captured and abused, where he allows his servants to go into captivity with him. And over the course of time, God defeats the wicked by destroying or converting them and emerges victorious and vindicates his people. Well, this is the gospel story in a nutshell, right? This is, this is God preparing his people for what it would look like when God himself allows himself to be taken captive, allows himself to be abused, allows himself to be killed so that he can use the, the very weapons of the enemy against them uh, to, to win the battle. So um, I want you to see this as an act of war. I want you to see this, this capturing of these vessels as an act of war because what we're going to see play out over the next five chapters is what this war, various battles or skirmishes in this war look like. And this is the first skirmish. This is the first battle. I want you to notice the, uh, the outline of the chapter here, okay? So each of these chapters... Um, works like a chiasm. And what I've told you about chiasms before when we were studying through the book of Habakkuk and even last week, that the way a chiasm works is that the, the beginning and the end of these books um, correlate to one another and work their way in. So picture a chiasm as a series of steps. So the beginning and the end relate to one another. These two relate to one another. These two relate to one another. And these two relate to one another. And so there's a chiasm that, that uh, takes place in five steps that structures the book of Daniel or, or the chapter one of Daniel, this narrative. So look at chapter one, verse one, right? It talks about the third year of Jehoiakim. Look at verse 21, the last verse of this, of this book, the first year of Cyrus. So there's a dating here that is going on in, the, in A and A that relate to one another. And then if you go, verses 2 to 7 relate to verses 17 to 20, right? First, it's the education of the captives is established. And here, the education of the captives is accomplished. If you go in further, chapter 1, verse 8 corresponds to chapter 1, verse 16, in verse 8, there's the resolve to reject the king's food. And in verse 16, there's the rejection of the king's food is accomplished. And then he keep going in. In, in uh, verses 9 and 10 correspond to verse 15, where there's a fear of a bad appearance that's revealed and a fear of bad appearance that's relieved. And so at the center of the chiasm, what is at the center of the chiasm is the test itself. Verses 11 to 13 are the test that's proposed. Daniel gives um, the chief of staff here uh, a proposal. Here's the test. And in verse 14, we see that the test is performed. So when we look at the structure here, what we see is at the center, that, that's a, a way of helping us understand what the big idea of a text is, what the big point of a particular narrative is. So what's at the center of this chiasm, what's at the center of this narrative is the test. So what this chapter is all about is it's establishing this test, which is the first skirmish or the first battle in this war that has been declared against Yahweh and against his people. So the very center of this story is the test. It's the pivotal point of the text and the crisis point of this narrative. It's the first skirmish or the first battle in this war. As you're looking through this narrative, I think one of the first questions you have to ask yourself, especially as I introduced the book last week, you have to ask yourself the question, why did Daniel dig in his heels here? Okay, so Daniel finds himself in a, in a hostile environment under a political power, right? And in that, under that political power, Daniel decides to resist the king's order. He, he decides to resist the, the law of the land. Why is it that Daniel dug in his heels here? We can't just say it's arbitrary. What is his standard? What is it that Daniel does or Daniel decides? Why is it that he dug in his heels? I think there's actually kind of two reasons for this. 
The first goes back to look at verse 2 and look at verse 10. I said that verse 2 was important. The use of the word Adonai, verse 2. And the Lord, remember I said that's a, a name of the Lord that literally means my master. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Okay, so that's verse 2. Now look at verse 10. The chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my Lord. So you see, even in the ESV here, you have this contrast. And the Lord, talking about Daniel's Lord in verse 2, and then in verse 10, the chief of the eunuchs says to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king. So the, the Hebrew word here is the difference between the word Adonai, which is the, the, the title of God for my master, right? My master, my God, my, my master. And the word I fear my Lord in verse 10 is Adoni, which is just the, the rendering to a non, non-entity, a, non, uh, a non-God. So essentially, this is a clash of masters, Okay. The eunuch has a master. His master is the king, is Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel has a master. His master is God. And so one of the first things that helps us have a clue as to why Daniel resisted the king's food is because it has something to do with who his master is. It's a clash of masters. The second uh, clue we have is in verse 5 itself. Verse 5, or actually, take a look first at verse 8, because Daniel gives us a reason. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. See, one of the first things that I think a lot of times we just assume is because there were a lot of dietary laws in the law of God, that when it says he would defile himself by not eating the food, we immediately assume that it has to do with the dietary laws of God's law right? So this must have been pork, or this must have been the way they're preparing the meat in blood, or whatever the case might be. It must not be kosher, right? It must not be up to Jewish dietary laws. But interestingly, the word there that uh, talks about defilement is not the word for being uh, rendered ceremonially unclean, which is what the Levitical law and all of the dietary laws, if you ate Uh, food that was unclean, you would become unclean. Our our English translations uh, translate it to unclean. Sometimes we think of that as defilement, but this is not the same word. Daniel wasn't uh, worried about becoming ceremonially unclean by eating the food. He was worried about defilement. Well, the Hebrew word there that we translate as defile is G-A-A-L, gall. It's actually connected, if you remember when we were in the book of Ruth, we, Gael is a kinsman redeemer. It has to do with being redeemed. The root of this word means to be redeemed. So when he's talking about not wanting to, to be defiled, he's actually talking about where his redemption comes from. The whole, the whole connotation of what he's saying here is that he doesn't want to be redeemed by the king. Now, that seems odd, doesn't it? Except look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. You might notice, depending on your translation, that there's, there's kind of an awkward wording here, right? The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. So was he, what, what does that mean? A, a daily portion of the food that the king ate. The reality here is that the Hebrew in this word, this line is actually really, really interesting. If you were to translate it just literally word for word without thinking through sort of how it would be structured, this is how the Hebrew would read in verse 5. So verse 5 literally reads like this, And the king appointed for them provision daily according to its day from the king's abundance. Isn't that, isn't that strange? The king appointed for them provision daily according to its day from the king's abundance. What does it mean that he, he, he apportioned to them something, a provision daily according to its day? According to what day? What is he talking about? Well, it seems really strange, except if you're listening through Hebrew ears. 
One of the interesting things that we have an advantage over many of the Hebrews who heard the, um, the Old Testament um, back before reading and writing was a common thing, right? We can read and we can study and we can highlight and all those kinds of things. But what we can't do as well as they could is hear. Much of the Bible was written in a way that it is supposed to be heard. That's why the structure is like in a chiasm. It's, it's, it's meant to have ebbs and flows. It's meant to enunciate, and, and the way it, it is laid out is meant to land with particular weight in particular areas. And so one of the things we lose is the awkwardness of certain words and, and also the repetition of certain words. That's why individual phrases, especially when they stand out as sort of odd, oddly phrased, oddly put together, would stand out in the hearing because we all know the difference when somebody says something a little bit off, right? Have you ever been around somebody? Um, in, in particular, uh, I, I have one particular friend who is just absolutely brilliant, um, but English is not their first language. And so when they... When they um, put sentences together, sometimes they, they flip the verb and the noun, or they, they, they structure the sentence in a way that still makes sense, but it just sounds funny the first time you hear it because they're used to how things are ordered in their own language. And so again, in Hebrew, this would have stood out a whole lot more, but that wording, and the king appointed for them provision daily according to its day from the king's abundance, is a very strange way to phrase all of this. Well, what does it mean? What's the significance? There's only three places in scripture where this kind of language, this sort of oddly shaped structure with the same content is put together. Three places. It seems to be borrowed from Leviticus 23, um, where God appoints particular feasts in worship of Yahweh. So he's placing particular feasts and particular worship days on particular days, right? So he's apportioning to particular days things for that day. It also is borrowed from Exodus 16, when God appoints a daily portion of manna, right? You remember that story when the Israelites are going through the wilderness and God brings manna from heaven. And what he says to them is collect enough. I've apportioned enough for you for today, so the, um, the allotment of manna was for each day. In fact, he says, don't collect enough for tomorrow. And some people don't listen to him. They collect enough for the next day as well, and it spoils on them. And what God was trying to teach them is that he is going to give them enough today for what they need today, and that they are to trust him for their portion tomorrow. Okay, keep that in mind. The third place in scripture where this sort of awkward phrasing and with the similar content is used is in 1 Kings chapter 8 when God answers prayer according to the needs of each day. And so there he talks about uh, giving and apportioning to each day uh, the prayer requests needed for that particular day. So some of the things that we get, and, and, and uh, Jesus kind of picks up on that whole idea that God apportions to each day, it's it's joy and it's sorrow. We have some hymns about that, right? That God apportions to each day. It's his ordained sorrow and joy. And Jesus picks up on that theme in Matthew chapter 6 when he's telling us, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough problems for today or for itself, right? Live today on the grace that God gives you today. So what does all that mean? Why even bring that up? Well, because I think what, what the king was getting at is if he is appointing for them provision daily according to its day, what the king of Babylon was teaching the people, what he was teaching the Israelites, those who were brought in under captivity, trust me for your daily food. Trust me for your daily provision. And so, so number one, you have this contrast, Adonai and Adoni, right? My master versus your master. And then on top of that, you have this provision language where, where Daniel wasn't going to defile himself, wasn't allow, going to allow himself to be redeemed, not allow himself to belong to the king who is trying to apportion daily their provision. Well, what Daniel would grow up knowing that God is his allotted portion, he would grow up knowing what Jesus would put into his, uh, the Lord's prayer many, many years later. Give us this day our daily bread. We call on the Lord for our daily bread. We don't call on the king. We don't call on the state. We don't call on the government. 
God is the one who apportions each day its joys and its sorrows, its bread or its lack of bread. And so why, does God, why, does Dan, why do Daniel and his friends decide to defy the king's order here? It's not because it's pork. It's not because vegetables are what God wants us to live on. In fact, there's nothing in scripture that talks about not drinking wine unless they were taking a Nazarite vow, which it says nothing about here. And so the fact that they were abstaining from wine, which the Psalms actually tell us, God gave wine to gladden men's hearts. Well, if any men needed their hearts gladdened, it was Daniel and his friends who were exiled from their homeland, cut off from their family and brought to Babylon. So they weren't giving up wine because it was a bad thing. They weren't giving up wine because it wasn't kosher. They weren't giving up food because it wasn't kosher. They were giving up food as a statement to say, my daily provision, my daily health does not fall under the jurisdiction of the king. It falls under the jurisdiction of my God who has promised to provide for me my daily portion. And so they were trusting in God So what they were rejecting is is King Nebuchadnezzar as their master and as their provider. What they're saying is God is my master, God is my provider. That's who we trust for our daily portion. And so the big idea coming out of that, I think the big idea that we have to wrap our minds around when we're asking the question, why is it that they rebelled, is this, that Daniel resolved to reject the king's food to demonstrate that God and not Nebuchadnezzar was his master. That's what this is all about. I just got here. You want to educate me? You want to name me? In fact, naming naming them was a sort of way of of adopting him, right? Putting putting, um, uh, the name of a son on him. And uh, it's interesting that actually uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son is named Belshazzar, and Daniel's name was Belteshazzar. And in in, in Daniel chapter 5, we're going to actually see the clash between Nebuchadnezzar's two sons, Belshazzar and Belteshazzar. But Daniel resolved to reject the king's food to demonstrate that God and not Nebuchadnezzar was his master. And so this test where he says, just test us for 10 days. 10 days is certainly enough days to go anemic if you're not getting uh, uh, any nutrients or anything, but not generally enough time for you to see any health benefits. Anybody who's, who's done a diet to try to get healthy. We're just in January here. So uh, maybe one of your uh, New Year's resolutions was to eat a little bit healthier. And you probably got a little frustrated after the 10th day because after 10 days, generally you don't see results yet. It takes a little longer than that, especially if you're breaking long, bad habits. So we have to look at this as the miracle that it was. We have to look at this as, as the grace of God that it was, that it was evident to this chief of staff to this eunuch, that Daniel and his friends were healthier after 10 days on this other diet, on, on 10 days as the Lord of their provider. And for any of you who, um, who have ever tried to give up meat, um, I don't recommend it. But for any of you who have t- ever tried to go vegetarian for, uh, for whatever silly reason you might have, um, you know that you have to look for extra sources of protein. Protein is incredibly important in our diet. And so a lot of vegetarians eat things like tofu, eat lots of seeds and nuts and, uh, and that sort of stuff um, where they get their protein from. Well, eating vegetables is not going to give them the protein that they need. And so we have to look at this as God providing, God um, answering prayer, God miraculously sustaining them and granting them supernatural health. So this test and its success moves us from judgment to blessing. All right, so in the narrative, they put their necks on the line, they go out there, they stand out, they defy the king's order, they're not going to eat the meat, and what would have placed them under judgment if this didn't work out, because God answered their prayers, because God provided for them, they move from judgment to blessing. The young exiles are in bondage, but through this, God shows his faithful presence to them, reminding them that though they're exiled, Though they're away from the house of their God, though they're out of the land of their God, their God has gone with them into exile, gone with them into Babylon. The test changes the very character of their education. Notice that Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to assimilate them into his kingdom, but it's now very clear that while they receive this education, they still go to Babylon University, if you will, they will build God's kingdom in the very palace of the kingdom of Babylon. 
That leads us to another sort of big idea of this text, that God is building his kingdom within the kingdom of men. God is building his kingdom within the kingdom of men. There's a neat biblical pattern, I think, um, that I was thinking about this, this week, where key figures are seen as sort of cornerstones um, and, other, and have three other corners with them. So here's what I mean. In Genesis 14, it's Abraham or Abram with the three young warriors that go with him to rescue Lot, four of them. In Exodus 24, it's Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's two sons that God is rebuilding the community, the ecclesia in the wilderness. In 2 Samuel 23, it's David and his three mighty men. In Job, you have Job, who is the king of the land, and his three undermining friends, who are sort of like court advisors. Again, there's four of them. Of course, in the Gospels, you have Jesus, who has Peter, James, and John as his inner circle. It's Peter, James, and John who go up with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration. And here you have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who are sort of the four corners to God's new kingdom being built outside of the promised land, right in the middle of the pagan world. So I think these these groups of four show that God is building something new. And each of those characters, each of the the people that I uh, mentioned, you could go in if we had the time to go in and talk about how they were building something new, a new um, new addition to the um, ongoing revelation of God's covenant and um, relationship to mankind. So God plans to use these four men, incidentally, right? Christ, who is the cornerstone, right? Um, Christ um, is called the pure spotless lamb without blemish. And, and isn't it interesting that we get in, in, uh, in the first few verses, verse four, who is it that Nebuchadnezzar brought to the palace? Youths, that is young lambs, right? Young ones, youths without blemish. So what we're, what we're seeing here is this idea that Um, the sacrifice of these men's lives in Babylon is going to bring about salvation and sanctuary to all the Israelites who are going to come to Babylon in the fullness of the exile. So God is using these four men, these four youths without blemish, to build a new house and a new economy. This house will be an empire within which the people of God will live. What we're seeing is we're seeing the the beginnings of the language of the New Testament, of the New Testament community of faith. Remember in in Ephesians chapter 2, God calls Christ the cornerstone and that we are all stones being built together for a dwelling place for God, that we ourselves become the tabernacle, we ourselves become the temple, and we go off into the pagan world, we go off as light into the darkness, and so God is here to build his kingdom within the kingdoms of men. God intends to convert Nebuchadnezzar and turn his empire into God's house. This shows God's kingdom will not be limited to a fixed geographical location, but a people who will spread out over the entire earth. God is doing something new, and there's going to be more on that next week as we delve into chapter 2. Sort of the last big idea that I want to share with you concerning this chapter, the last big thing that I want you to think about, is this idea that before big public victories, God calls his people to small acts of faithful obedience. I say that again. Before big public victories, God calls his people to small acts of faithful obedience. Their test in this chapter was 10 days. And the king found them to be 10 times more impressive than every other graduate of Babylon University. This was a small test. They were of the royal line of Judah, which means that they were used to good food, and they gave it up. They gave it up in order to be tested, in order to be shown, to demonstrate, to show to an onlooking world that God and not Nebuchadnezzar is their master. It's interesting, um, in a commentary that I've been enjoying by Nolan Faywell, he says this, Irony of ironies, the four who disobey the king's order are the four who show themselves to be exceptional. The four who refuse to align themselves politically with the king are the ones chosen for royal service. Moreover, 
the independence of, four, of the four is underscored by the narrator's use of their Hebrew names rather than their assigned Babylonian names. And so there's this small test that seems so small. Ten days, test us and see if our master will be a better provider who will give us a better provi daily provision than your master. Test us for ten days. And then not only do they pass, not only does he sustain their health, but he also blesses them in their, in their studies, in their understanding, in their discernment, such that when they stand before Nebuchadnezzar, it's no accident that he finds them, it says, 10 times more competent than any other um, wise man in Babylon. And why is this so important? It's important because it's setting the stage that not only does it promise that in the midst of a hostile culture, God is with his people. His faithful presence goes with his people into hostile environments and stays with them and sticks with them. But beyond even that, it reminds us that God uses small tests of faithful obedience as the launching point for bigger public victories. Because in chapter 2, it is all the wise men of Babylon who are called upon to interpret the king's dream. Daniel and his friends are called upon as well, and they get a big public victory such that Daniel and his friends are promoted in Babylon, given a place of honor in Babylon. And how did it start? Because of this small private victory, a small act of defiance against Nebuchadnezzar in order to be obedient to God. And on top of that, I want you to think through that this is a pattern in Scripture, that Daniel, before his big public victory over Goliath, had the private victories of defending his sheep against the lion and against the bear. God gives us small opportunities to prove our faithfulness and our obedience to him in order to mold and to shape us into the courageous men and women that we're called to be so that when the big tests come along, the big public events come along, we've learned obedience, we've learned courage, we've learned faithfulness so that we may be faithful with big things. God's word tells us not to despise the days of small things, right? He who is given much, much will be entrusted. He who is faithful in little will be given more. This is one of the patterns of scripture. And so look around at your life. You might wonder why it is that God hasn't used you for bigger things. Perhaps you feel as though you're called to bigger things. Perhaps you can see big things on the horizon. Times when the church of God and the individuals who make up the church of God are going to have to be bold and courageous. What small acts of obedience is God placing in your life? Areas where you can show faithfulness. What are those areas that are right in front of you now? And how is it that God is preparing you, testing you, testing your obedience, testing your faithfulness, that you might not only be found worthy in the small things, but that he might give you bigger things as well. God is our only master, and we must look for ways in a hostile culture to show allegiance to God before any other master. This is the story that sets the stage for the rest of the victories. This is the first battle, the first skirmish in the war that God has declared against Babylon. And I want you to think about how God declares war on Babylon. He declares war on Babylon with the plans to transform it into his agent on the earth. God doesn't defeat things just by winning. He defeats things by converting his enemies by overtaking his enemies, that they would serve him and serve his purposes. And so in the midst of the most powerful empire on earth at the time, you have four faithful men who are the cornerstones, the building blocks to a house of God that he is building right in the midst of pagan Babylon, because the house of God will always prevail against the house of the Dagons, the Mardukes, the Babylons, and all the pagan gods who do not, who are not real. All right, love you. Um, let's pray, and uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to preaching the rest of this book. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is always relevant. I thank you that it is always fresh. It always gives us things. It is living and it is active. So it trains us for the battle that's right in front of us.
I pray that your spirit and your word would um, reach out to all of us and to stir us to action. Help us to find the application of these, these verses. Help us to be stirred by your spirit and by your word alone. And help us be prepared for the bigger battles that are on the horizon. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient. Help us to live life like you are our master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.